Welcome everyone to the Google Podcast. I am your host, Rob Watson, and in today's show, I am speaking with uh, Dr. Anton Cricketh, who is a medical doctor, multiple Ironman finisher, and also a functional medicine specialist. So I think his wisdom and knowledge and expertise is going to come, I can imagine it be very useful to plenty of people that could be listening to this, not only just to improve the health and performance and fitness, and um, but just general overall health, because, you know, we're, we're coming at this time now we're speaking hopefully coming to the end of this pandemic um, where there's been a real focus on health and well-being and realizing how you know people's health that is generally people have been affected during this is people particularly with maybe ill health so um so maybe there'll be some useful information so first off anton thank you for speaking with me today no and um, thanks for the introduction and, and my my pleasure rob look forward to the chat so if you could give us a little bit of an introduction, maybe to yourself, maybe a bit of your background, how you've got to, you've obviously been doing this for quite a few decades now. Um, so yeah, if we could hear a bit, that'd be great. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm a conventionally qualified doctor. I'm, as you can probably tell from the accent, I grew up in South Africa. Um, I trained, I went to med school in South Africa in Cape Town. And uh, med school for me was sort of late 80s through the early 90s. So I've been a qualified doctor for over 25 years, um, turning 51 this year. And, uh, and I came over to the UK when I was 25, 26 years old. I've been based for that entire time around Lancashire. Um, I originally came really with the intent to use an opportunity to travel around Europe and see the world. Um, but as, as life is unpredictable, you, you often, uh, a woman comes into it and you end, you end up uh, not moving. So I, I ended up specializing in the field of intensive care medicine and anesthesia in the UK um, and got those postgraduate qualifications or Royal College, etc. So I've, uh, I've been a consultant in the NHS um, for 16 years now in, in that area of anesthesia and intensive care medicine. Um, but also involved in sort of subspecialties within that, where I've, uh, in my hospital, I introduced something called cardiopulmonary excise testing, um, really as a way to accurately assess whether people are fit enough for major surgery. And if they aren't, why they aren't, and how we can optimize them and get them, get them good enough for surgery and get them through it without complications. Um, so th and that ties obviously with some of my, my sporting background. So that, that kind of testing is on a stationary bike where you measure things called VO2 max and anaerobic threshold and all that type of thing. Um, I've also in the NHS for the last couple of decades been very, very involved in clinical research, um, both conducting trials, conducting research, academic work, in lecturing at sort of international conferences and so on, um, but also involved in research management. I was the R&D director for our big organization for eight or nine years. And I still lead um, research within the anesthesia specialty for, the, for Greater Manchester and Lancashire um, in terms of us delivering these sort of big studies that can help to improve um, outcomes in the NHS. So that, that's sort of my, my uh, NHS medical side of my story, um, I kind of accidentally happened upon the combination of sort of functional medicine, integrated medicine, ancestral medicine, this whole sort of combined paradigm, probably about seven or eight years ago. Um, really, really through, I've always been an avid podcast listener before they became a thing. I was listening to podcasts when you had to download them onto an iPod before smartphones were invented. Um, and I ended up, as you do with podcasts, following one link to another, I was really following endurance podcasts. And I ended up hearing somebody who's a functional medicine doctor interviewed on an endurance podcast. And everything they said just absolutely sounded so logical that I ended up following their podcast and another, et cetera. Um, and really just the idea of optimizing myself, because at that stage, I was in my early 40s. Um, so going, going back a little bit, I've, um, apart from the medicine and professional side, I've been a lifelong endurance athlete. So I started, um, you know, really started as a runner, ran, ran sort of a dozen marathons before I was 21, a few ultras, 
then got into triathlon when I was 23. So we're probably talking, you know, heading towards 30 years of, of, uh, of triathlon. Um, and obviously when you're hitting your forties, you, you realize that you're potentially going to slow down and, and uh, not be able to hit the same sort of performance. So it's looking for ways to, to, uh, to maintain performance. And that's when I came across the, the, you know, sort of low carb diet, dropping gluten, this type of thing. And then very interestingly, I did it entirely for those reasons, but, um, within a very short period after making some of these dietary changes, I'd had a pain in my left wrist from an, from a fall and an injury when I was 19 that I'd had for over 20 years. It stopped me ever being able to do press ups on that wrist or take weight on it. Um, struggled to sleep every now and again. And, and on scan, we'd actually seen there was a tiny unhealed fracture. Anyway, that pain just disappeared a couple of weeks after these nutritional changes, along with uh, a few skin conditions that have slowly kind of evolved over the decades and all of them are just assumed were just uh, things to accept and were aging changes they all disappeared um, my blood pressure which was starting to edge upwards and probably borderline for treatment at 43 suddenly dropped by 20 20 millimeters of mercury systolic and diastolic and became absolutely optimal so uh, that's where i kind of triggered me into this whole area but uh, sorry, Rob, that is almost sort of a nonstop monologue there of my, my background into it. But uh, yeah, no, that's great. Um, no, it's really interesting to hear that sign of background, Anton. So I'd just like to focus then a little bit on um, the changes in diet and stuff. So because change the diet and also being an athlete, because there's a little bit of a, probably a myth, maybe because in terms of the way we live, that a lot of people as they'll get to like, 40s 50s might think that the health's going to really decline mm. if they've been doing endurance athletes they might think the body might start to break down it's so in some ways um so what were you kind of what diet were you having and what did you actually change i know you said you went low carb take out gluten but what what were you kind of what was your lifestyle before you made that shift because you must have been still relatively healthy if you're doing all these you know ultra marathons and stuff yeah, well, um, having said that, in terms in terms of the sort of training I was doing at that stage, um, when I was forty three, I just then had the third third child, so I had three children, sort of under under five or under six, um, which you can start to appreciate now. Um, so I'd moved very much my triathlon to still um, training, but training much you know minimal amount of hours and doing much shorter distance events. So I'd moved, I'd, I'd moved away from doing those kind of Ironman type things and ultra things. That was more in my twenties and early thirties. Um, but I was still, I was still exercising regularly and still doing, doing these sorts of events. Um, the, so what, what my, uh, if I think back what my lifestyle was up until then, I'd come very much from the misconception through most of my life as almost everybody does that you can out train the bad diet and now train everything else. So I used to think that 90% of your performance was your exercise program, your workouts, and 10% was maybe the, the diet and lifestyle stuff. I then re very quickly realized it's exactly the reverse. It's 90% all the lifestyle factors and really 10% the training and the, the workouts. Um, what my, my diet wasn't bad in that it was mostly a, a real food diet. However, it was, it was, it was very carb heavy in hindsight. So for example, my breakfast would have been a toasted bagel with marmalade on um, hundred percent carb and sugar. Um, I was often eating in the hospital canteen, which is just um, everything would be carb laden, cooked in vegetable oils. And, you know, an example might have been um, the hospital's beef lasagna with chips or, you know, a, a massive thing of hospital ready cooked chips with um, some curry um, ladled on top of it. Um, and the supper at home would have been reasonable. It would have been vegetables and meat, vegetables and fish, etc. But certainly that breakfast and lunch is, you know, complete, complete disaster. Um, the other lifestyle stuff around that is that I, I really um, sleep wise was, you know, I was, I was pushing in my younger years as a consultant, I was trying to achieve a lot 
I was starting all sorts of projects within the hospital to improve things hospital wide, you know, setting up new kinds of clinics and resource research, all sorts of stuff. So I was very frequently emailing until one in the morning, you know, and writing, working on work related stuff on the laptop most nights and late into the night. So it was a completely, uh, so, you know, creating a, a, a high stress environment, uh, a disrupted sleep environment, and as a consequence, lots of caffeine throughout the day, you know, easily half a dozen cups of coffee. And I used to have two sugars in every cup of tea or coffee, two teaspoons of sugar. So if you add all that up as well in terms of total sugar dosage. And then training used to involve, you know, there'd always be a carbohydrate mix in your water when you went for a swim session or did a bike or whatever um, for sessions that don't need it at all in duration. So there's that additional carb sugar load. Um, I went, so I'm, I'm quite different to the majority of people in terms of mindset and being able to make changes. I'm probably actually quite representative of um, athletes whereby we do have the advantage when we do make these lifestyle changes that I, if we decide we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and we're going to move from that lifestyle to this new one, can almost overnight just implement it and start it. I've had to really be um, have the insight and learn that when I when I treat my patients, that that isn't the way the average person can do things. So ninety percent of the population, you really need to. Um, have lots of different strategies and to help them make those lifestyle changes and often needs to be a gradual process, often benefits from the support of a health coach, using all sorts of techniques, etc, to make those habit changes. But for me, fortunately, um, I, I really just decided, I, I, I decided what I was going to do and I did it the next day, you know, I went from that toasted bagel in the morning, all the, the sugars and the tea and the coffee and milk in it and that breakfast lunch there to the next day having um one black coffee only no sugar you know just went cold turkey um you know went to take taking in some tin, tin of sardines and and uh, and salad you know to take my my work my, my food to hospital and have the usual tea so i just headed hardcore almost straight away overnight and made the change and essentially it was what i would have called at that stage a no sugar no grains um diet so really dramatically cut sugar low carb probably you know not intentionally ketogenic but probably straight in and out of ketogenesis um and and essentially removing grains yeah it's really interesting to hear that and particularly one thing you mentioned about you know um hospital food and um you would really think that <laughs> the food that we would get in hospital should yeah. be, you know, the absolute, you know, it should be like what you're talking about in terms of, yeah. you know, the low sugar, um, low carb approach to it, um, less processed food. But, you know, you go there and you, it, it kind of, it jars with the idea of health. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't seem to marry up at all. Um, no, absolutely. Have you seen any signs of shifts and changes in that at all? Not, not um, unfortunately, I don't see it in terms of the food that's been delivered to the patients. No, it's exactly the opposite of what you would want to optimize recovery from surgery and from illness. Um, but you know, the, the NHS is, as we all know, what it is awesome at is actually the stuff I'm involved with in the NHS. And that's getting people through major surgery. It's critical illness survival stuff on the intensive care unit, which is what my day job is. And you can't knock the NHS for that. There it's brilliant. Yeah. But when it comes to this chronic non-communicable disease and the basics of nutrition, etc., cetera, um, it's unfortunately a Titanic. And even if you start to try to make the shift towards the right thing to do, it, it takes a decade to turn that Titanic. You know, it's just such a big behemoth of an organization uh, it's just slow, slow to to uh, to turn things. Yeah, so, yeah. I, th yeah. I think ultimately, you know, if, if I'm in if I'm in that position where myself and my own family is in hospital, I take food in. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, yeah, it's a it's a challenging one, isn't it? There's no doubt. You say um, 
it's it's such as like ch- turning the Titanic around, isn't it? A little bit, you know. Um, yeah. But the thing I think about it as well, like I spoke to other doctors about it, if we can get those fundamentals right, there's going to be less pressure on the likes of the NHS as well going forward because chronic diseases seem to be the thing that in the West we haven't quite conquered. It's kind of just very much the approach to saying, well, you're going to have to generally be medicated on this. We might not be able to cure it. We might be able to manage it. Where yeah. from my own experience of working with a functional medicine doctor and working with nutritionists and stuff and realizing that actually by changing your lifestyle, changing your diet, getting the right supplementation, doing some proper forward blood works as well to find out what the root causes are of some of your issues, you can completely transform your own health. And if we were able to do that, on a grander scale, then I imagine that what you're doing in the NHS, it'd be mainly focused around that rather than, you know, the, you know, the chronic illnesses. Absolutely. Um, and if we look at the scale of this, it's not only not getting better, it's, it's dramatically, well, it's, it's, it is its own pandemic. I mean, uh, um, there's a chap called Phil Maffetone who will probably, we might mention he might come up again in our conversation around um, endurance and training and so on. But he wrote a good article about COVID itself. It's the collision of two pandemics. It's uh, diabetes, so that's a combination of obesity and di- diabetes, diabetes uh, colliding with the coronavirus pandemic. And it's a perfect storm. It's why the West has been hit so hard with this compared to the Asian countries. Or the, um, and the other Asian country it has been hit hard recently, obviously, you know, is India. Part of it is a variant, but part of it is also because they also have a phenomenally high incidence of diabetes um, and not as easily recognized because um, South Asian people don't generally get uh, externally obese. So they, they get what they get predominantly um, increased organ or visceral fat generating their inflammation and, and, and develop type 2 diabetes without being externally obese, which is more the pattern we see in Caucasians, in Amer- you know, particularly Europe and America. Um, so that wouldn't have helped their, their recent large hit with, with COVID over there. But if we look apart around the other parts of Asia, Japan, Thailand, you know, Taiwan, etc., who've had very low rates of serious COVID and death, and they equally also have very low rates of obesity and type 2 diabetes, whereas contrast that with the United States and us, um, you know, even Italy, etc. It's a real collision of two, two problems together, one exposing the other. And a real opportunity has been missed, actually, because there's rightly been a big focus on, um, on, the, on the standard health measures to control spread and the deployment of vaccines to, to add, so that we've got an immune system for it, but a complete, um, completely ignoring the low hanging fruit that this was the best opportunity ever to improve metabolic health in the country. Um, there's that old, old, old saying of never waste a good crisis. And this is a golden opportunity to use a crisis as leverage um, because never before would you have got buy-in from the public to make lifestyle changes, but it's been squandered really. Um, because like we've been saying, these, these lifestyle and um, nutritional changes, you can actually take somebody from being insulin resistant to being insulin sensitive within a couple of weeks. It is as fast as that. It doesn't take months and months. They're, they're not going to. They're not going to go from being obese to being um, normal weight within a couple of weeks. But the metabolic changes happen very rapidly, and that could make all the difference between COVID that you stay at home with and COVID that you have to be admitted to hospital or ICU. Um, you know, and I've I've treated over five hundred COVID patients in our ICU. And there's not a single one of those people that was lean and, you know, athletic. And by and large, we are overweight or, or obese by definition. Um, just on that, there was an excellent show actually that was on. I think it was on during the pandemic in 2020. It was on um, Channel 4. There was a researcher and his wife is a doctor. And he took, um, I can't remember the name of the doctor. He's done a show on sleep as well. 
And he took about eight different people and basically put them on a ketogenic diet, restricted their calorie intake to about seven, 800 calories a day. Some of these people had put on about three stone during, during the pandemic. Yeah. And it did all the blood works and it was phenomenal the transformation of them in the space of three weeks. Yeah. And it, it goes to show how you can do it. And the thing for me about that is, it's like how empowering it is as well for that individual to know that you can take hold of your own health and you don't have to feel like you're a statistic. Like when you get the information through, like I've been getting the, the vaccination leaflets coming through the post and the way some of it's worded, it's like, you know, one in a hundred um, can die from this. And if you're in this age, one in 10. And it's a bit like when I hear the cancer statistics where it says one in two people will get cancer on the news. So I could be yeah. sat there watching this with my wife. Yeah. So, but if you just look at that and go, well, actually, if I look after my health, then I don't yeah. have to be a one in two. I can be a one in 10. I can be a one in 20. I can be a one in 50. And I think yeah. we've also missed the trick as well as in terms of the messaging that we've had over the past year. It, it feels quite fearful. Like if you were to switch on the news, listen to the information that's coming from the top down approach, it doesn't really feel like it's making people like, you know, it's putting people in a more fearful state when actually that's the last thing we need to do. We know fear, it causes anxiety. Anxiety affects us, our health, our stress levels. Um, so what do you think some of the quick wins that people could be doing then to mitigate as some of the challenges that we have around COVID, but also just for you know, improving metabolic health? Um, and well, it, 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 it is the key lifestyle factors. And if we go through the simplest things um, and, and before I go into them, probably just talking back um, to what your, your, um, your example there of that program where they, where they use the diet and they very rapidly changed those people's uh, metabolic disease. Um, it, it's an, an interesting site that um, I'd encourage people to look at is a group in the United States called Virta Health, V-I-R-T-A. And they, 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 um, they're setting out to reverse a million, um, well, a hundred million people with type two diabetes and taking a ketogenic dietary approach, but using a very sophisticated model. It's a subscription based site, but then people get um, comprehensive baseline blood testing they get given means to measure ketones. They get given link to health coaches. They get the whole dietary um, stuff provided, et cetera, et cetera. So, and they've got phenomenal results. But also importantly is that they've got some key academics involved. And they've done a phenomenal amount of research on all along the way with all the people they've involved. And these research outputs have been published in some very high output um, peer-reviewed medical journals so there's a whole section on their website which is sort of research outcomes and they're continuing to churn it out so it now can't be you know there's there's no argument it, it works and it works extremely well and they've been able to demonstrate huge percentages of the patients that have gone through that verta system coming off half a dozen different medications um, no longer needing type 2 diabetic drugs or blood pressure drugs etc cetera, etc cetera. So that, that's worth looking at. It's uh, the woman who's, who's the chief medical officer is Sarah Hallberg, um, and she's the chief, um, the main author of a lot of the publications. So we've got good evidence now. It's not, you know, it's not just um, fringe stuff. It's really solid evidence. So if we think of, if we think of the things that can um, immediately turn around your metabolic health, um, we're talking about specific things around sleep, stress, movement, and eating um, and and all of them are interlinked so when i say sleep it's really more about um optimizing your circadian rhythm you know our bodies are designed to have a natural 24-hour biological rhythm to them and and that means that awakeness and sleep should happen where they where they're normally meant to happen biologically in other words we were designed for millions of years to start getting sleepy and go to sleep as the sun goes down and start becoming awake and waking up as the sun goes up. Um, and obviously with modern life, we've completely disrupted that with people watching you know, um, screens until late at night 
um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the knock-on effects are pretty big because there's a lot of important things that happen in the body around those circadian rhythms. So if we don't go to, go to sleep on a normal sleep cycle and then get the correct phases of sleep, so get deep sleep when we should. So if you go to bed really late, you're going you're gonna to cut out a lot of your deep sleep phases because that happens during the first half of your sleep during the night, whereas your REM sleep tends to happen in the second half of your sleep. Both are important, but different things happen in those different phases. But in particular, during deep sleep is when our body is, is getting rid of all the junk. That's when mitophagy and autophagy occur. So if you've got defective cells that shouldn't be there anymore, that's when your immune system can take them out. And i.e., as we're becoming middle-aged and beyond, we're making cancer cells every day, every minute. And the only reason we don't all get cancer is because our immune system is fantastic at spotting this stuff and getting rid of them. But a lot of that needs to happen during that deep sleep. Um, also, all of our detoxification systems to get rid of all the toxins that all of us accumulate in the world we live in now, that peaks during that phase of sleep, deep sleep phases. Um, the, so some of the knock-ons of this Obviously, if we get inadequate sleep and deep sleep, we, we're disrupting those processes. Um, accumulation of toxins in itself will affect our metabolic health. That will be one of the things that can lead to insulin resistance, is a build, a, a, an in, a build up of a toxic burden in the body um, and chronic inflammation and then insulin resistance, which is where we can't control our blood sugar uh, correctly. Um, it's been shown that if you have a single night, we have five hours sleep instead of seven or eight, your ability to control your blood sugar with your insulin is 25% worse for the next 24 hours. So, so major factor there in terms of metabolic health is sleep, sleep both quantity and quality. Um, and we can talk about things about how to go about optimizing that, but if we just park sleep there, um, Stress, obviously, we, we all get in constant low-grade stresses instead of the way we were designed, where we we're just designed to get a big stress, you know, run away from a tiger and then survive and then chill out and not be stressed at all until the next life-threatening event happens. Now we're getting stressed throughout the day, every five minutes with emails and bad news and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we know the effect of that, whatever form of stress it is, whether it's work stress, psychological stress, excessive training load stress, it's all going to increase inflammation and again disrupt our ability to control blood sugar and ultimately that's going to cause metabolic disease. Um, if we come on to the food side of things, um, what I will say is that carbohydrates probably Carbohydrates and sugar don't necessarily cause us to become insulin resistant, but once you start to develop insulin resistance, then you, you no longer can tolerate the carbohydrates and sugar. And then you're going to start to have raised blood sugars and, and not, or you're going to have much bigger spikes after eating a carbohydrate and take much longer for it to settle down to a normal level. Um, what are probably what's useful is actually to define what we really mean by metabolic disease or metabolic syndrome. And that's really a, a combination of several criteria. And um, starting one, one of them is to have raised blood pressure. Um, so if your blood pressure is raised, that's one criteria. Um, if we look in those sort of lipid panels that, that the GP can do, they tend to overly focus on total cholesterol and the LDL numbers, but actually the criteria for, um, for metabolic syndrome is having a raised triglyceride level. And they talk about a raised triglyceride level that's greater than 1.2, but I really, or 1.5 rather, to me, anything greater than one is significant. And that, that marker, blood marker triglyceride, that can start to become raised 10 years before you actually see a change in your blood sugar. It's a very, very early warning shot that you're starting to become pre-diabetic and you're starting to get metabolic dysregulation. And that'll change before your HbA1c, which is a measure of your average blood sugar the previous couple of months. Um, another one of the criteria in that is your waist circumference. 
And another criteria is a, is a blood marker of inflammation called CRP. So any of those things, a couple of those going up and you defined as metabolic syndrome. But I, to me, if you've got any one of those that's off and is not optimal, you, you're developing metabolic disease. Um, and there was a recent study in a, um, coming out looking at a very large American population published two or three years ago. And they found that only 12% of Americans are metabolically healthy. Wow. Let that sink in. 88% have one of those markers, at least one of those markers that is abnormal. Crazy. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely crazy. Um, I know it, it, it feels as well, like what I find about this, like the more I've done, like I've delved into this now, like I'm certainly nowhere near the level of any of the, generally the people that I'll really specialize, I'll interview, but you know, I've absorbed a lot of this information over the past 10, 15 years myself. And you start to realize that actually some of the solutions are simple. Now, yeah. And it, it can be simple to adopt. Like, for instance, you said before, you suddenly, because you were absorbing all these podcast information, at some point, a light bulb moment you had, and you just sort of flicked the switch and went from the bagels with in the morning to just black coffee and then the low carb diet, and you show a big change. But it, it just takes that mindset shift. And, yeah. and then you used to see, because for me, as soon as I started to see some of the effects, that just empowered me and gave me even more yeah. energy to go, this is amazing. If I can do this after a week, two weeks, imagine what it'll be like. Because I like to think that the things that I do now, I'm paying it forward. Like if I, I'll choose to eat organic food because my it's gonna my future self is looking at me saying, Yeah, make these changes yeah. today. So I'm I'm paying it forward and making these changes. And the more of us we can do that and it's so tricky because you look at this time, I think there's a statistic now that since records began, children that are being born now are going to, it will, the, the life expectancy is, is lower than say what the parents are on, yeah. on the whole. And it seems like it's the first time since record that's kind of dropping. And yeah. we only have to look around to see, see what's going on. I'm slightly concerned in some ways what the past year has done to people's health for the long term as well. But that could also be the catalyst. I did hear a statistic that I think maybe a million people stopped smoking last year in the UK, um, which is pretty, you know, good to hear. Um, so what are then, what are some of the changes that if someone's listened to this now and uh, they could either already be on this health journey themselves or they're thinking some of the changes that they could be making, whether it's around supplementation the pro probably before I jump to this to the supplementation, um, we probably probably useful just to to walk through what we could do with the basics because I think it has got Perfect. to start there. And, and I was I was describing almost sort of the physiology of what goes wrong when we start to get that sleep wrong and stress and eating etc. But so one one way is maybe useful to describe it for listeners. Um, is to think of what perhaps an ideal day would look like to turn around your metabolic health. Um, so if we, if we start the day with waking up, um, if we want to, the first thing we want to do to start to reset our biological circadian rhythm to make it work correctly is to try and step outside and get natural sunlight onto us as soon as possible. Because that's going to do a couple of things. It's going to shut down our melatonin production which is what was keeping us asleep. And it's gonna cause a natural surge and peaking of our cortisol, which is gonna get us to full wakefulness. And that's gonna start our biological circadian clock ticking. So it's gonna, it, and that's been shown on its own to improve your sleep for that following night, because you're starting, you, you've got the clock started correctly at the correct time. And ideally, if you, if you enjoy caffeine and a coffee, as I do, try and avoid it for that first 30 minutes, because that allows your cortisol to rise naturally, rather be, than being spiked by the caffeine, and then, then have the coffee. I appreciate it, it's usually raining and overcast where, in, in our part of the world, um, but you are still obviously getting the sun's light through the clouds or whatever it is, so you're still getting that effect. Um, if you want some bonus points, Step on your grass outside bare feet and get some grounding. 
and uh, and just do a simple little movement routine of moving each joint five times in each direction, starting at your head, starting at your wrist, go to your elbows, shoulders, etc. While you while you're getting that just passes for five minutes, um, at, while you're getting that light onto you, and and then really just try to get get your get a get a glass of filtered cold water in with a bit of a little bit of salt in it to add some electrolyte. And, and a bit of lime or lemon or whatever to offset the taste and help digestion. And then just it, it just ensures that your cells are actually getting hydrated rather than just the water going through you. Now, if you, if you are trying to get control of metabolic health and you have got issues in your metabolic health, one of the things that we now have quite good evidence on is this concept of time-restricted eating, where aside from, if we, if we look at nutrition, there's really only three things we can change. We can change the type of food we eat. We can change the amount we eat. So we would call the type we eat dietary restriction. We could, with the, the amount we eat or the dose, dosage of food, we would call calorific restriction. And then we can alter the timing of when we eat. So we'd call that uh, time restriction. So time restriction, calorific restriction, and dietary restriction. Those are the only three levers we have in this kind of triangle of nutrition. And we can tug on those three things to modulate um, our outcomes. And so that easier, simplest thing before we actually get anybody to change how much they eat and what they eat is simply to restrict the amount of time in which they eat. So most people would often eat straight away and then keep, um, you know, they might eat dinner at between 6 and 8 p.m., but they'll carry on snacking right up until the minute they go to bed. So if the first thing they do, they can set a restriction that they maybe wait an hour or two after they wake up before they start eating. And if they can ensure that they never eat anything within two to three hours of going to sleep. So whatever your planned sleep time is, is if 10 p.m. or 11 p.m., you stop eating at 8 p.m. or 7 p.m., etc. That eating within three hours of sleep is one of the biggest things to dis disrupt your deep sleep phases and take it out. And that's because you're asking your body to use its energy at digesting food while you're asleep, where it should be using all that energy for those processes we talked about earlier. And it can't do both. Um, so, and, and you can see how things are interrelated. Things we're doing for nutrition also affect sleep and vice versa. So if people could, grudge, could and it's not asking a lot to get people to move to a 12 hour eating window. And I've, I prefer to call this time-restricted eating rather than um, intermittent fasting. Both of those are actually the same thing, but one has a positive psychology to it. You're restricting your feeding window rather than you starving yourself for a certain amount of time. So, and, and gradually, ideally, people narrow that feeding window down to eight hours or 10 hours. So I spend eight to 10 hours eating 16, 18 hours not eating. The next thing to consider is the type of food. And at the simplest end of things, before you do anything fancy, really just eat real food and whole food. So if you cut out everything processed, you're making a huge difference already because you're getting rid of a lot of um, vegetable oils, which are all inflammatory and cause, and, and in themselves are probably one of the major underlying um, root causes of generating insulin resistance are some of these vegetable oils to the damage they do to the fat cells and the insulin mechanism. Um, so if you just stick to the rule, if you don't eat things that, that are packaged and have you have to read the label to know what it is, um, you've made a great start. So whole foods. Focusing on non-starchy vegetables, um, meat, fish, nuts, seeds, and non-starchy vegetables. You've kind of you kind of really tick most of the boxes. And then if you want, once you've got on top of that, you know, you start with the time restriction to your eating, then you move to just eating whole foods that are real food. And then the next thing is that you can look at restricting your carbohydrates. And this might either be a stepwise approach, if you're somebody who struggles with doing things abruptly, or you might go cold turkey and go right down. If we look at, at um, I always encourage my own patients that I treat with my clinic. I have everybody use an app that I find the best one for my purposes called Chronometer. 
C-R-O-N-O, meter, M-E-T-E-R.com. Um, the, the free version is adequate. You can pay a premium version for some extra um, stuff, but the, the free is all I use for everybody. And that gives, a, if you put in a couple of days of food, it, it gives you an eye opener of what you actually currently do, because it's usually nowhere near what you think you're eating once you actually see it broken down. And that'll show your macronutrients. You'll see how much protein you have, carbohydrates and fats. And what we're interested in is the net carbohydrates. That's subtracting the fiber impact. But also importantly, it will show you how nutrient dense your diet is. In other words, is it filled with lots of adequate vitamins and minerals, the micronutrients? So that chronometer breaks all of it down when you put in your day's food and it shows everything. Um, now, one of the key things that I deviate slightly from some other um, people in this area is that I actually think the starting point before we get too focused on how much fat one should eat and how much carbohydrate is to ensure that we're getting optimal amount of protein. And that's for several reasons. Uh, one is without adequate protein, we can't build muscle, lean muscle mass. And it's not that we're trying to be bodybuilders, but it's very important that we that we both generate muscle mass and maintain it. Once we're over 40, it gets harder and harder to build muscle mass for the same amount of protein. We have something called anabolic resistance, alongside the fact that our testosterone and growth hormone is coming down. Um, we, so we need it for the lean muscle mass. Both That's very important for longevity and, vo and um, voiding or frailty when we really do start to age. But there's another, there's a reason for it metabolically. The more muscle mass you carry, the greater reservoir you have to shift your blood sugar into. So when you eat that food that generates some blood sugar, you can, you can dispose of it more rapidly and more effectively the larger your muscle mass as opposed to it staying high in your blood and then getting stored as fat tissue. The other reason we want that optimal protein intake is that that provides, um, that is all the enzymes in your body to, to, um, to, to make sure that every important chemical reaction, and there's actually several billion, billion chemical reactions occurring every second in your body. For them to occur at the right rate, they need enzymes. Enzymes are made of amino acids from protein. If you want your immune system to work, what are antibodies made out of? Amino acids and protein. If you want bone health, everybody talks about calcium, magnesium, but those minerals are laid down in a protein matrix in your bone. So protein. The other reason the protein I'm keen on, particularly with people who have a weight problem or struggle to stick with the diet, is that it's the most satiating of all the macronutrients, even more so than fat. So if you get protein in a meal, you're going to feel less hungry more quickly and not need to snack in between. So you need to make sure that all two or three meals you're going to eat have protein in them. Currently, most people often have a breakfast that has no protein, and then all their protein is backloaded into their dinner. And that's, that's problematic for the reasons I've just outlined and also because you're not getting that satiety effect, but also because there's, there's a saturation limit of how much you can absorb in one go. So you can only absorb 30 to 50 grams of protein in one go. And if you need 150 grams for the day, it's no good to eat 150 at dinner because only 100 of it's just gonna pass through your gut and not go in. So get the protein right first and aim for one and a half to two grams per kilogram per day for most adults. And then if most people, obviously, if we're dealing with metabolic disease and we're trying to sort that out, the approach then does need to be low carb, high fat. And low carb would be defined as anything under 100 grams of net carbs a day. But if we're going to very low carb, then we're talking under 50 grams per day and even under 25. And how extreme you need to go really does depend on the state of your metabolic health at this particular time. Rob, I've gone on a long monologue there, which I'm prone to do. No. Um, I've got a lot more to say about the, you know, this what we can do around that. But uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts or want to chip in at this stage. No, that's that's really useful, and I think it's really great to just sort of lay it out in that process. I'm a, a fan of, um, you know, eating within a window, particularly twelve hours, 
Um, I know that I sleep better. I don't go to bed feeling full. You know, sometimes if I've eaten late at night, I'll go to bed and my tummy will be feeling uncomfortable throughout the night. That's the opposite of what it needs to be doing. Um, and yeah, I've heard that for quite a while about getting up and just getting outside, even if it's raining, you know, I'm quite fortunate. Yeah. We've got some chickens in the back, so I'll tend to go out and get the eggs in the morning. So that's yeah. an opportunity for me to, um, to get some light and stuff. Um, on well, owning, owning a dog is the perfect tool to, to achieve it. They, but it is. Hard walk and then uh, you've got that win-win. Yeah, I heard someone saying that people who have gym people who have gym memberships and people who have dogs. The people with dogs get four four times the amount of exercise compared to people who have gym memberships. And well, pe- people who own dogs actually do live longer on average than the non-dog owning population, and there's many biological plausible reasons for that. Yeah. Uh, one one is they make you walk them at least two or three times a day, so you're getting movement. Um, if they lick you, there's evidence that they share their gut microbiome and improve the quality of your microbiome. And when you fuss a dog and they lick you, they actually increase both of your oxytocin, which is a stress relieving hormone, your hormone. So, yeah. That's a perfect win win, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, I also heard that as well as part for children that grow up. If children grow up in households with dogs, they have a stronger uh, microbiome because they're around like pretty much what you're saying there with them licking, but they're just around that. So, you know, sometimes we've got this obsession and maybe if you've even gotten worse the last year with germs and stuff, well, actually we need it around, don't we? We need it to build, build strength and build um, um, longevity. No, it's crucial. Mm. Yeah. That app sounds amazing, by the way. I'm definitely going to be checking that out. Um, and the fact that it's a free version, um, Chrono Meter, um, definitely be checking that out. Um, one thing I'm interested to know is that because I know that I've really experimented quite a few different diets over the years until I've got to the point where now where I feel like I think I mentioned just before we started, I actually got some blood works back today for my thyroid function. A few years ago, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's hypothyroidism and some of my inflammation markers were super high. Um, just before that time, I was kind of vegetarian, vegan. At one point I was going down the raw vegan path. That was kind of, I was watching all the stuff online. I was like, wow, this is the way we should all be raw vegan. Um, and then that soon collapsed when I realized how my health was deteriorating or my um, nutrient levels, vitamin levels were, were dropping. I was lacking energy. I finally have not say stumbled across, but my journey has, has evolved to a, a paleo style ketogenic diet where I'm now eating, you know, good quality meat, eating, um, yep. again, wild fish, good quality meat, you know, grass reared, uh, organic beef. Um, and do you see like, because obviously I've got friends, I was vegan. I've got friends who were vegan. Um, do you think that, you know, there's people can still approach this uh, way of, diet and this way of your thing on a vegan diet or what's your thoughts on that um so anything can be done but it is very very challenging uh it's in my view so when it comes to anything in life there are always going to be some rare freakish outliers you know who can get away with anything but they are not, you know, they're the 0.1% of the population. The vast majority to be able to do that sustainably would have to really blood test regularly, probably every three months and diligently supplement. Um, I don't think it can be achieved without supplementation um, to, to make sure that you're not becoming depleted of micronutrients. And part, part, of, the, part of the risk um, you know, is that if you if you get your macronutrients grossly wrong, you you'll feel the difference within a few weeks. You know, if you're overeating, undereating, you know, you to- totally way out with with the the bulk that you eat. You'll notice it quickly. But if you deplete your micronutrients, it could take months before you actually see the ill effects on your health. But by the time you do, you could be really ill from it. And some of those effects are aren't reversible. You know, like the effects of B12. If you inadvertently become B12 deficient, that can cause nerve damage that's permanent and doesn't isn't re- repairable. You know, most of the other things, if you then replace them, they'll they'll recover eventually. But 
not everything. So I, I don't think it's sustainable. You know, we, we've, we've been Homo sapiens for about 250,000 years. We've been some form of human for 2 million years. For all of that time, we've been omnivores. We've evolved as omnivores. We have the gut of omnivores. We have the dentition omnivores. Um, our cells genetically are designed to be able to, that with those requirements. And that doesn't change within a few decades. You don't alter you, the human genome at that speed. You know, so you, you, you can't fight biology, ultimately. Um, now, that doesn't mean to say, obviously, I respect anybody's, um, you know, diet that they wish to be on. That's just my expert opinion about the physiology and the biology of it. Um, I, I have patients that, you know, that, that are vegetarian or vegan and stay on it. And then I'll just advise them as best I can to, to achieve the goals we're after within those constraints, you know. And then in terms of protein, you are going to have to use lots of different blends of animal-based protein and a lot of it. You know, so it'll have to be mixtures of hemp protein, pea protein, rice protein, etc., um, to to get anywhere near hitting those protein targets. With the understanding that plant-based proteins are not anywhere near as bioavailable. In other words, for the same amount, you don't absorb. You only absorb a fraction of what you absorb of animal protein because we're not designed to absorb that type of protein. If you think of it. Um, for a lot of vitamins, minerals, and proteins, and amino acids, the animals have done the job for us. They've eaten the plants, and they've then activated that molecule in terms of active format, the format that our bodies actually use. Whereas when you eat it in plant format, um, you then have to do a whole lot of chemical processes to be able to transform it into the, into the vitamin format we can actually use for our, for our chemistry. And we also then have the problem, not all of us can do that as well. Some of us have genetic SNPs where we, we, we aren't able to methylate certain things or transform certain things. You know, so then, then we're in even more trouble. Um, a, a book that I'd recommend people looking at to just have a completely flexible, open mind to all this stuff, um, because that's a big risk we've got in the world nowadays, is, is a lack of open-mindedness. You know, we've got lots of camps fighting each other. And this is a problem in science in general, you know, where the whole point of science is to constantly question and question the dogma and, and you know, and just, just read and think and make up your own mind. And uh, a very a good a book that puts it together fantastically well is Sacred Cow by Rob Wolf and Diana Rogers. And they divided the book up into three parts. One was talking entirely about the health component and, 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 and um, debunking a lot of a lot of this. Um, so talking really about the chemistry and about protein quality, et cetera, et cetera. The other bit was talking about the actual reality of environmental impact. And a lot of that is, is incorrect. And, and then covering the ethical components. So I, don't, I won't say anything more about it because it, it's, a, it's obviously an inflammatory topic in general and, and people have very heated views on it. But I'd encourage anybody just to be open minded, have a read of that book. Um, gives a lot of perspective and might be contrary to a lot of what um, is put out in Netflix movies, etc. No, I think you have to be careful with them. I know for myself, I watched the likes of Cowspiracy, Forks Over Knives, Earthlings, all these documentaries that I watched maybe about seven or eight years ago. And I was very influenced by them. And you... Yeah, yeah. You know, one thing I've become much more the past few years is to use my own discernment and yeah. do my own research off the back of it rather than just listen to someone talk about it and assume that is, you know, is true. I do understand from Cowspiracy that they had to come out almost and apologize and revise a lot of the figures that they spoke about. I think they yeah. said sort of, you know, whether it was um, methane or cows or animal uh, agriculture was causing sort of like 40% of the CO2 um, yeah. emissions when actually it was something like a fraction of that. Um, and one thing that I find yeah. interesting is it, um, how if we are eating more local, natural, and if animals yeah. are grazing uh, on the land, the, the way that's sequestering a carbon back into the soil, and they're actually, it's, they're not only the carbon neutral, they're carbon negative. 
Um, and that's quite right. that's right. A, that's quite amazing to it. Now, don't get me wrong; it doesn't quite get around. Some people will choose not to eat it because of the animal, and they think it's a sentient being, and they don't feel comfortable with that element. And I can appreciate that because that's one of the reasons I was like that. Um, but to the environmental issue, there seems to be much more of an issue with monocrops around the world. Like you know, if you're getting wherever delivered and it's coming from thousands of miles away as well and you think oh well it's vegan but actually well what damage is that causing and um yeah no no absolutely there's so much detail to it and, and all of that's covered fantastically well in that book and they actually made a documentary film linked with the book called sacred car as well um no you're absolutely right i mean uh, it, it it's uh, if it's regenerative um agriculture in other words where you've got um cars that are rotating around different fields, eating off the land, et cetera, rather than in a, in a shed. Um, they are carbon negative. They're, it's just the natural life cycle. And the, the, the monocropping is not just the environmental impact of all that food being flown all over the world. It's also destroying the topsoil. And that's not being spoken about. In theory, there's potentially only 30 to 50 years left of our topsoil. And when the topsoil goes, that's the end. You don't grow anything. Um, no plants um, and that's monocropping the other thing on the ethical side that that's interesting around sentient animals etc which um, if anybody ever they, you wouldn't want to but if you're going to have a look at what's stuck to a combine harvester after it's gone through a monocrop field it's all manner of living beings that are sentient and really the argument was are, are rabbits and all these other animals that that are cropped because basically they churn through thousands and thousands of small animals when they when they harvest those crops um are they more important than another animal you know so it's 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 tricky it's tricky yeah. but um, one's got to you've got to look at all the angles yeah it's not black but, or white. If, no no but if i confine myself purely to what i'm most knowledgeable on and i'm not a climate expert or an ethicist yeah. but if i look entirely just at what is required for human biology and physiology that i am an expert in and you know there's no argument about it yeah yeah can't buy this biochemistry one thing uh, we went to uh, sweden quite a few years ago we went up to the north of sweden right up to the arctic circle and we went out with this guy and went ice fishing with him and um he was kind of a modern day kind of, well a real life bird grills and he would go out hunting with his brother and they would kill a moose or kill a deer and that moose or deer would last them for six months they would use every single element of that animal and i think they're because they're willing to put themselves out there and they, you know hunt for their own animals there's much greater connection we've lost our connection with food we go to a supermarket you said before it's in a packet it's wrapped up yeah. we don't understand where it's come from and yeah. you know i think it was that jamie oliver um did some he did something in america and he was showing kids f fruits and vegetables and the kids had never seen some of these vegetables before but of course yeah. they've seen a big mac they've seen the pizzas they've seen all the stuff like that and it's all got we've got a kind of i have this thing that keeps coming swirling up in my head it's like we need to get back to our roots the way we used to be, the ancestral way of being, not to discount all the modern technology we've got, but use the modern technology to our benefit in yeah. harmony with the planet rather yeah. than feel like we're just fighting against it and destroying it. And like you said, yeah. we've got 30, 40, 50 years left of topsoil. That should be a huge wake-up call. We've got 8 billion people on the planet. That's probably going to be 10 billion by 2030, 2040. We are coming to a real crisis point unless we really ch like change the direction massively of our of our society really absolutely no i couldn't agree more and 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 that's exactly the 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 my, my outlook on this from a lifestyle point of view is really trying to get get one um matched with our original evolution in other words an ancestral approach i'd actually the way I think of, although my, my own clinic where I do my private work um, has, has the main feature has been functional medicine, I actually think of what I do as a blend of functional medicine, which means you're trying to discover the root causes of the chronic medical condition and address the root causes, 
and that's really the paradigm of, of functional medicine. I think of integrative medicine where, to me, integrative medicine is basically use anything that works. So I'll use supplements, but I might use a prescription. I'll use lifestyle changes. I'll use red light therapy. I'll use whatever I think is safe and, e and effective if it can combine those two. So it's integrative, it just integrates everything. And the other is an ancestral health approach. In other words, try and get us all as close to what our, what our evolutionary biology requires. Um, but make use of all the technology to enhance that on top of it. So exactly what you're saying, use tech, take the best bits out of technology to enhance our ancestral approach. Um, I mean, a case in point would be that I'll try to do all those basics around sleep, but I, I wear an aura ring to track my sleep and my readiness for training, et cetera. So that's ultimate technology, but it's being employed in, in, in order to optimize my ancestral lifestyle. I was, I couldn't, I, I was going to mention that before. I couldn't quite tell. So a few times on your finger, those who are watching the video version can see it now and it's quite yeah. subtle and it's actually quite, they look nice as well, actually as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you feel some things like that are a game changer, things like that? And also the chronometer app, they can really help people to um, get a, a, a snapshot really maybe of what's truly happening to them on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, well, there's 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 the, the the there's the old image of what what gets what gets measured gets managed. Um, Peter Drucker, the great economist, and had that line: "What gets measured gets managed." Um, but I think it does very much depend on individual personalities, because ultimately, what you're trying to do is to try and find the best techniques to enable somebody to make the correct lifestyle changes. And everybody is different. So some people, I think, um, giving them um, wearables and things to be able to monitor different parts of their physiology and measure what they eat, etc., can be really, really effective and it can help them make changes. But you can get other people where it becomes a stress in itself. And if they see, and each day they wake up, they see a bad sleep score, then they sleep even, even more badly the next night because they're stressed about sleeping or they have a look at their chronometer and they constantly see, you know, the wrong macronutrients or whatever, and then they, they give up altogether. So I think part of the trick is to assess your patient and try and understand where they come from. And this is particularly an area, the developing area of health coaches that support functional medicine doctors. And they're more, the, the, well, they're coach, essentially, essentially what you think of as a coach, where they, they, they really help the implementation. You know, I would come up with the ideal plan and then you, the coach is the person can help them be accountable and implement it. Um, a great book around implementing any lifestyle changes. I don't know if you read Atomic Habits. Oh, um, I've got the book actually. Um, yeah. Is it what? Um, is it someone? Uh, Kel James. Oh, yeah. Um, let's see if I can see. James Clear. It's not clear, is it? It is James Clear, yeah. Yeah. Atomic habits. Yeah. Yeah. And it is it is just this idea of making very tiny habits and just starting with making a single tiny habit rather than trying to make, you know, change 20 things at once. And then you build on these and you stack habits, etc. Um, but the book takes you through all sorts of tools and ways to do it, etc. So it's a it's a fantastic book for making making changes. Um, so for me, for instance, I'm I'm a data guy, and you know my day job is a lot of data. So I I like that kind of thing. I like measuring. You know, if if I'm training, I'm you know I was an early I started using polar heart rate monitors in the in the late 80s early 90s you know when nobody had hardly anybody had them i was running with heart rate and cycling with heart rate and stuff so it, it helps me it makes it makes me make changes and my 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 weakness has been this cracking the sleep thing i found it very easy to make dietary changes and i'm quite disciplined at, at exercise and working out and um, but the change for me was was the sleep thing because I'm always trying to do too much in the day, as a lot of us do. Um, so look, looking at those metrics in the aura was really trying to use it as a way to shame myself 
when I could see I was going to bed an hour later than what I really wanted to and aim to, et cetera. Um, and it also does bring home some of the things, you know, I spoke about that eating within three hours of, of uh, um, going to sleep. Now that, that's something that I became really strict with myself probably a good two or three years ago where I, I don't eat beyond 8 PM ever. I don't have solid food. I'll only have, you know, liquid. Um, and that, that would usually be herbal teas or, or just, um, you know, mineral water and that kind of stuff. Um, and we, we were talking before we went, started recording, that I was, uh, my wife and I were away for a night at a hotel this week. And intentionally, I just let, you know, I let everything go for the night, you know, and I, and I, I basically was, I had, I still, I had a lot to eat at about, you know, nine o'clock or something and went to bed sort of half an hour after eating this quite, quite a big meal. And the next morning, my, my deep sleep for the last six months has, has been getting better and better as I've made various changes around sleep. And I've got myself now to eventually get over an hour of deep sleep to an hour and a quarter. My deep sleep the morning after having that meal within half an hour was 12 minutes. Wow. It was shocking. It's the lowest deep sleep I've seen on myself in a couple of years. And all this information is relayed through the, the oral app as well in the morning. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it really brought it home. It absolutely shows, you know, it, it shows how, what a big factor it is. It's not just, um, you know, something in a book. You can actually test it and see it. I think it really helps certain people who, who are struggling to wonder why the health is off. Like, why is something like this happening to them? They might think, I'm doing, I feel like I'm doing everything right, um, but there's just something that's missing. One, one thing, you mentioned Rob Wolf before, and I've followed Rob Wolf's work for a while, and I noticed that he, it's interesting because in many ways we're all different. I like to think sometimes, I, I look at the way he talks, reminds me a bit of myself and my wife. I feel like I have to be a bit stricter with my yeah. approach to be on the same level as her. Like, for instance, um, I think Rob Wolf was talking about it. Maybe he was doing blood sugar testing his glucose levels and they tested him and his wife and something he could eat, like complete compared to when they both ate it, his got completely spiked and it didn't yeah. even, didn't even like register on her. And that might've been something, what you consider something quite, you know, standard food. Um, yeah. No, that's, that's really interesting. And, and he outlined a lot of these, one of these books called Wired to Eat um, was, was about that, essentially. And ultimately, I mean, I do this with my patients. Um, I kind of usually do this as like a second step. So I would get those basics in place first with somebody who has metabolic issues. And then kind of step number two is to personalize their carbohydrates to them. So most people are probably familiar with the idea that we have this GI index, glycemic index for all the foods. You'll see it printed, you know, and it might, I can't remember the exact numbers, but let's say a, a white potato is a glycemic index of 100 and a piece of broccoli would be a glycemic index of 5 or 10. And it's essentially just saying how big your blood sugar jump would be after you eat that type of food. Um, now, what people don't realize is that they, they came up with these GI index numbers in the mid 70s, and it was based on a study involving 10 men. That's it. 10 men. They gave 10 men different food and measured their blood sugar, you know, a period afterwards. And that, that's not gospel. No, nope. it's like a lot of things, you know, five and two or people, people don't, um, people don't realize where evidence has come from. And they never question it, just gets repeated over and over and over again and cited over and over again in one book or scientific publication after another until somebody actually goes back and sees where, where, where did this knowledge originally come from 30 years ago? And, you know, that, that's the strength of it. But interestingly, Israelis did a huge study a few years ago involving thousands of people where they did the same kind of process, gave people different carbohydrates, et cetera, but used very sophisticated tools. They gave all these people continuous glucose monitors, and they also did a advanced measurement of their gut microbiome using stool testing and measuring DNA of the gut microbiome. Um, and ultimately, the long and short of it is that the GI index is not, is not far off as an average. So if you average the whole population's response to a potato or a piece of broccoli, it's about what the old GI index came out with. However, the individual variation is massive. 
And I might get a massive spike to white potato and no spike to white rice. And you might be the other way around. And they both got the same GI index on the scale. So what I, I, I actually use, I actually nicked this from Rob Wolf and I, I called it, it's a seven day carbohydrate challenge where I get people, I've, I've created a document for it. So it has tables with the different, um, you know, different carbohydrates you can select and the exact size of the serving to equate to a certain amount of carbohydrate or sugar. And it's pretty straightforward. They, they first thing in the day, they pick that thing. Let's just say it's white rice. You measure out the exact amount of white rice and you, you can get yourself a glucometer off Amazon. That's for measuring your blood sugar with pricking your finger. Um, you can get a decent one for 20 pounds. You measure your blood sugar first. So you get a baseline and then you eat that whole bowl of the exact measurement of white rice with nothing else because you're just trying to test that single component. And then you set, an, you set a counter for two hours time. And when it goes off, you measure your blood sugar again. And if it hasn't dropped below a certain threshold, you know that you, you can't really handle that particular carbohydrate in that amount. You, your options are either excluded from your diet or you could retest again with half the dose. And if you get away with it or half the dose, then you know, well, you can eat it, but you need to cut it down to that amount. And then you, for a week, you choose a different carb each day. And, you know, it could be a sweet potato the next day or whatever. And then you truly personalized your carbohydrate tolerance to different carbohydrates. And you can get real surprises. That's really fascinating for me. That's one thing that I've not actually done is use a glucose measure. I've got the ketone measure that I'll use to, to see what my ketone levels are at. Um, but I think it's something that I'd like to explore with the glucose measure because, again, that's another thing where people could think, they're eating well. They could think, oh, I'll have sweet potato with a meal and I'm eating, you know, but not realize that could be the thing that's spiking them. But actually yeah. rice would be okay for them, even though they might think, well, I'm going to be paleo, but actually rice could be fine for that individual. Oats could be fine for that inv individual. Um, but actually some of the paleo food might not be. So it's kind of being flexible and as you say, tailoring it for the individual rather than kind of being a bit dogmatic and having like, I'm just going to be, this is the way I'm going to be because I've read this book and it works for someone else. Um, and and, and there's, there's, there's so many nuances, you know, so one, one is we're all by individual and that's really where functional medicine comes from. We're all absolutely individual in, in, in how our bodies work. And the, the, the other factor is, as I mentioned, part of that study is measuring their gut microbiome. And there's a huge influence um, with so many things on our bodies, our gut microbiome, but including our insulin resistance or in, you know, uh, glucose control is influenced by the makeup of your gut microbiome. Um, and, and they saw that in the study. They saw different biome signatures affected different um, results on their continuous glucose monitor. I do, um, what is, is going to be become ubiquitous as a, as a wearable as time goes on is continuous glucose monitors. And potentially just short term for people who wanna make these metabolic health changes to give them an extra kick and essentially, you could do what I've just described as Rob Wolf's seven-day carb challenge, but you could do it um, to a much greater level of accuracy and detail. Um, and there are quite a few of these companies out. I, I've, I've put together a resource for my own patients who are interested in it to, you, to wear a continuous glucose monitor just for two weeks or four weeks. And that can be enough to learn what you need to know, to learn what, what spikes your blood sugar, and not just food. The timing of exercise, the timing of sleep, certain beverages. Um, and the other thing is timing, you know. So you might look like you're tolerant to white rice, but it may be that you're good with white rice in the morning, but not in the evening. So we add, in general, we add our most insulin sensitive around late morning um, and not as much around evening. But that may be changed by when you do your exercise because we become more insulin sensitive immediately after workout. So you know, there's all this nuance. Um, I think we probably do. We probably have yeah. overloaded your audience. Um, but it, one final real quick and easy one, I'll say for metabolic health for everybody, just go for a 10 minute walk about 20 minutes after your meal. Makes a phenomenal difference in how rapidly blood sugar shifts to, to, the, to the muscle. Yeah, and that's so simple, isn't simple it? Everybody can do it. Yeah, yeah. 10 minute walk, 20 minutes after meal. 
Well, it's been absolutely fascinating. I could most I could talk about this stuff all day because I find it so empowering and so exciting to think some of the things you do, like some of the stuff you talk to me about then here, you know, it's like light bulb moments where I'm like, ah, I could be thinking about this, this. And imagine the shift that we would have in the collective if masses of us took this information on board, empowered ourselves to do it. In a generation, we will complete, completely transform the health of the entire planet. And we've got an opportunity. I don't think we all are, but I think a significant percentage of the planet are willing to, um, you know, we're seeing it already. Millions more people are being embraced by this information. It's becoming more popular than ever. Um, yeah, and the, I think it, the change is going to happen this way through podcasts and blogs. It's going to come from the ground up rather than from the top down. Absolutely. And again, that just shows that that's where the power lies, isn't it, with the individual? Um, but honestly, Anthony, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Now, if anyone is listening to this now and are thinking, right, okay, I would love to um, you know, find out more about Anton and um, how they might be able to you know, work with you, become a patient, what's the best way for them to find out more about you? Um, well, my, my, my web address is a fairly long-winded one, so I don't know if you have show notes that you, you can pop that into. Um, but my, my clinic is called Best You Functional Health Clinic. Um, but they're probably likely also to find it if they Googled my name, Dr. Anton Kricher. Kricher spelled K-R-I-G-E. Um, probably one final word as, uh, as we finish, um, Rob, that I didn't mention right at the outset, is that um, just the, the typical doctor's disclaimer on, on podcasts and nothing that I said is personal health advice to anybody. Um, so everything we've discussed is, is just generic discussion, but uh, nothing should be construed as personal health advice. So anybody should, should uh, you know, see their own practitioner to, to get appropriate advice and diagnostics, et cetera. Excellent. Well, um, thanks for dropping on. And thank you very much for your time today. And I'm, uh, I'm sure plenty of people will find um, this extremely useful. I know I have. So um, thank you for your time, Anton, today. Yeah, my pleasure, Rob. Fascinating interview there with uh, Dr. Anton uh, Cricky, um, all uh, wrapped up. You know, I could talk about this stuff like for hours and hours, and I'm sure plenty of other people either feel the same about me or switched off after five or 10 minutes. And if that's the case, I'm still just talking to the hardcore kind of, um, I don't want to say health nuts, but people get really get really excited about making changes to their health, making sometimes subtle changes, sometimes having to make quite large changes, like changing your, transform your diet could feel like quite a big thing. But if you do it by step-by-step -step approach, you talked about that change clear before with the atomic habit habits, something I've kind of been doing myself the past few decades. We think if you just make small changes, but you continue them, those small changes turn into big things in the long run. Um, and we all have a potential to have, uh, you know, great health and well-being. Because I, I talk about this podcast and, I, you know, we want to become our best version of ourselves. And I think one of the ways of us doing that is by optimizing our health and well-being. We're going to enjoy our life far better if we're feeling in a good place physically and mentally uh, rather than just feeling like, well, the complete opposite of that and not enjoying life. I know for me, when I'm feeling good in myself, feeling at the right kind of in the right state, I'm far better to able to enjoy life and, and everything has to offer. So anyway, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend. You can subscribe to this if you're watching it on YouTube. You can also click the little bell button so you'll get notifications when there is new episodes available. Um, you can also um, leave me a review on Apple. That'd be amazing. If you're feeling particularly generous, you can also um, become a member on my Patreon page for as little as a price of a cup of coffee each month to help me to continue to put out these episodes with inspiring individuals like Anton and many others that I have on the show. And I want to just also just a little last mention to the, I'm actually supporting Positive News Magazine with this episode who have been doing good, sharing good news for many decades now in the time, this time that we live in where there's so much kind of negativity in the press, they are a real shining light on um, 
bring an awareness to the good things that are going on around the world and not just glossing over stuff. No, you know, but it's in from an empowering way how we make change. Now, if anyone wants to become a subscriber to the magazine, I've got an exclusive offer available for my listeners. If you go onto there, I'll leave a link in the show notes to Positive News Magazine. If you go in there, if you put in do good 20 or one word, you can receive 20% off a subscription. So I don't get any kickback on that. That's just me reaching out to them and something that I wanted to be able to offer to my listeners. Um, so anyway, I'll leave it there for today. Um, until next time, have a good one. <laughs>